Hello, I'm Kathy Jen with the Levy Senior Center Foundation. We are happy to welcome you to today's Levy Longevity Program on Gut Health and You, presented by Dr. Khalil Udin. This longevity series is presented in conjunction with Ascension Illinois and the City of Evanston. In these sessions, common issues of concern for adults 55 plus will be discussed so we can learn ways to live well and age gracefully. As always, we appreciate your support of the foundation as we continue to work to connect our community of older adults. I'd like to now turn things over to our wonderful moderator and partner in organizing these programs from Ascension, Illinois, Samantha Cochran. Thank you, Kathy. My name is Sam Cochran and I'm an athletic trainer by trade and the sports medicine liaison in the Chicago Metro region with Ascension, Illinois. I'm going to start off by going over some housekeeping items. First, all attendees are muted for the duration of the presentation. Questions may be, excuse me, may be submitted using the Q&A feature in the bottom center of your screen. Please do not use the raise hand or chat feature or attempt to unmute. We will not be able to hear or see you. Additionally, it is not permitted for this presentation to be recorded by attendees. However, it is being recorded and will be available on the Levy Foundation YouTube channel and website. Lastly, this presentation is intended for information purposes only and is not intended to replace individualized care provided by your respective doctors and or practitioners. Ascension Illinois and the Levy Foundation are not liable for the misuse of any information presented today. Now, I would like to introduce you to our speaker. Today, we have Dr. Khalil Udin with us. He is a family medicine physician with Ascension Illinois. He employs an evidence-based approach to medicine and focuses on overall health of the person and not just disease. Dr. Khalil Adin, I now turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Uh, welcome everybody to today's lecture series. Um, we'll begin here. Okay, let me get this thing going here. Give me one minute. All right. Okay, so today's topic, as many of you know, is gut health and you. Um, so just to start off, I want to just introduce myself. Um, so I'm Salman. Uh, people call me Dr. K uh, at the clinic that I work at. Um, so just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm board certified in family medicine and osteopathic manipulative treatment, uh, which is OMT. Um, and I got my a uh, bachelor's degree at, at uh, Loyola University of Chicago. I had a bachelor's in biology with a minor in chemistry. I went to Midwestern University where I received my doctorate degree in the, at the Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine, my uh, DO degree. And um, uh, afterwards, I went to the Beaumont uh, Health System and did my family medicine residency there uh, in the uh, greater metro Detroit area. And currently, uh, I've uh, moved back from the um, Michigan area, and now I'm uh, practicing at Chicago at the uh, Peterson Avenue location in the West Ridge neighborhood. Um, that's my primary practice space. I also practice out of Evanston uh, at the San Francis Hospital Medical Professional Building. All right, so a little bit about me. All right, so today's topic is gut health and you. So just to start off, we'll just start off with something very basic, okay? What is gut health and you? So go with, we'll go through each word. So what is the gut? So the gut refers to, essentially to the in entire digestive system, uh, which is known in the medical uh, field as the, as the uh, GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this includes uh, starting from the mouth, uh, down to the uh, throat, the esophagus, which is a food pipe, down to the stomach. Also associated organs are the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas, which surround the stomach and are in the uh, abdominal area. Um, and from the stomach onwards to the small intestine, where digestion occurs, and then to the large intestine and down to the rectum and anus. So the entire uh, uh, gamut from your mouth all the way down to the anus is what's referred to as the gut or the GI tract. Okay, so um, what is health? So gut health and you. So what is health? So uh, WHO or the World Health Organization defines ha health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or uh, um, infirmity, uh, which essentially means that 
a person's well-being is what's most paramount, not necessarily that there's an absence of disease. And so we'll get into this. So this is kind of a important definition that I'm putting up front, but we'll get into this later on uh, um, uh, at the uh, future slides. Okay, and then gut health and you. So what do we mean by you? So you is obviously every single person. Um, uh, uh, every single person is a unique sentient being, meaning that a, a person that has ability to make choices and is aware of their surroundings which all of us are actually subject to genetic and environmental influences. So this also plays a part in our uh, gut health. Um, so having said that, I want to once again provide a disclaimer uh, that, you know, we're going to talk about certain uh, topics and certain uh, possible treatments and medications and supplements and diet and exercising and whatnot. So before implementing any of this, talk to your personal physician and um, uh, to make sure that it is appropriate for, uh, appropriate for you, because in certain situations with certain patients and certain individuals, it may not be appropriate. Only part of it may be appropriate, but um, uh, that needs to be uh, that conversation needs to be had with your physician. OK. All right. So let's actually start the um, slides here. Um, so today's topic is about the gut microbiome. So what is a microbiome first and foremost? So a microbiome um, is consists uh, consists of microbes. Microbes are pretty much microorganisms, and microorganisms that are present within the human body are a number of thousands of bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Um, and actually, trillions of microbes coexist coexist peacefully within our body at least for majority of the time. And uh, most of them, most of the microbes are actually localized in our GI tract and within the GI tract, I mean, they go from the mouth all the way down to the anus, but specifically a large majority of them are located within the stomach, the small intestine and the large intestine. And specifically in the large, in, large intestine, there's an area called the cecum. They're also present on our skin, and it's very interesting, actually, that they're present in different colony amounts and in different um, uh, concentrations along the entire length of our body on our skin, which is another discussion um, uh, in and of itself. But the ones that are found in our GI tract are referred to as a gut microbiome, and that's what we're going to concentrate on today. Okay, so this is a picture of a very bustling city. Uh, it's actually in, I think, downtown Manhattan. Um, so I uh, put this picture in because this kind of shows how congested or how vibrant, uh, rather, uh, our um, microbes are. There are trillions of microbes. And so it's kind of like uh, the microbes are kind of doing their own thing, but they're also intermingling with each other. Um, they're not necessarily fighting. Uh, sometimes there could be some disagreements, you can say. But most of the time, you know, they're kind of doing their own thing. And but they're all within this, you know, localized area of the GI tract. And so this kind of gives you a picture of, you know, how you know, vibrant that area can be. OK, now within the gut microbiome, right, we talked about that there's uh, um, bacteria viruses and fungi now so far as this is actually a very novel area of research uh respectively um and we don't have much uh, uh information yet about viruses and fungi although there is some uh, that is coming out but what we do know uh, uh quite a bit about are the different types of bacteria that are present in the gut microbiome so there are about 1,000, up to about 1,000 bacteria species in the human gut alone. And what's really interesting as you dig deeper is that many of these, uh, of these bacteria, uh, they play an important role in our health. And when they're off balance or when there is a prolifer prolifer I can't speak. <laughs> when there's a proliferation of a certain um, bacteria species, that in uh, uh, which is out of balance, it can cause disease. So um, it's so important, and we'll get into this in the future slides as well, that it's so important that some experts even consider the gut microbiome as a supporting organ 
because of its key role in health and disease. And this a fun fact that I put in here is that you actually have more bacterial cells in your body than you do human cells. Like your actual cells in your actual human cells are, I think, 30 trillion. And there's actually, uh, I believe there's 40 trillion bacterial cells. So we're actually more, if you want to, you know, take a look at it in, the, in one perspective, we're actually more bacteria than we are human cells. Now, obviously, there's a symbiotic relationship going on, but it is, yeah, it is quite interesting that there's actually more bacteria than actual human cells. And this is this is quite important uh, because the gut microbiome is actually present even before uh, a person is born. So initially what, what was thought was uh, that the gut microbiome starts to develop once a baby is born, but now new research shows that it actually is present in the womb. So, um, uh, and, and this actually starts the process of the baby acclimating to the human environment. And um, what it does uh, is the, the gut microbiome, it helps digest and helps produce certain key um, uh, substances that our body needs, such as vitamins, hormones, amino acids, and neurotransmitters. It actually is produced or can be produced in the gut. It also helps our immune system. Um, the immune system actually kind of grows up with the gut microbiome, so to speak, with all the different bacteria and fungi and viruses. Um, and the immune system actually gets acclimated to the gut microbiome and does not, um, does not, sometimes cannot, or, well, initially does not take the gut microbiome, even though it's bacteria and it's foreign, does not take it as a foreign substance. It actually recognizes that this is part of the human body. Now, when there's certain, obviously, disease states, then um, the immune system can recognize that and then uh, cause a uh, reaction appropriately. Uh, the gut microbiome also metabolizes drugs. So certain drugs, certain medications that we take um, cannot properly uh, uh, activate or become active without the bacteria that is present to actually cleave it and actually make it into its active form. And this actually occurs many times through the gut microbiome. Okay. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. The gut microbiome serves as a nodal point for systemic health. And what I mean by that is um, if you, well, a good way to explain it is maybe to take its opposite. So when there is not, when there is a lack of balance, there is disease. So in, in uh, imbalance in the gut microbiome, okay, in the flora of bacteria, fungi, and viruses, when there's a lack of balance in that, you have something called, in the scientific uh, community, called gut dysbiosis, which pretty much means that there's an imbalance that is causing an unhealthy state, which essentially means that a person is going to be prone to disease. All right. Now, what are some of the symptoms of dysbiosis? Okay, so dysbiosis, um, symptom, symptoms of that are quite a few, um, and I've only listed uh, just a few, few of them here. So some of them can be bloating, heartburn, diarrhea, and or constipation. You can have fatigue. You can have a depressed mood. person can be more irritable, all right? Uh, they can have a decrease in their ability to concentrate. They can have skin rash. They can have eczema. They can have vaginal infections, rectal infections, and urinary issues. They may not be able to urinate properly, or they may have pain when they urinate. So what the recent studies show, uh, recent meaning within the last 20 years, show that the gut microbiome actually influences pretty much almost every organ system. And scientists have called this a nodal point or like a... Uh, a fulcrum for systemic health. And this is quite um, groundbreaking. This is quite surprising. Um, I'm, I don't know if any, any of you have heard of this before, but when I was doing my own research, I was quite surprised because when I went to med school some, you know, 10 years ago or whatnot, this was not taught. This is something very new. Um, and actually the gut microbiome pretty much influences, influences the entire body in different systems. And 
Um, so they did different uh, scientific verification studies to see, okay, is this really true? Or are we just kind of getting something that's, you know, um, more of like a red herring or, you know, something that's just like a fluke. Um, so they actually did a ton of, ton of different studies. And one of them that they did, interesting, interestingly, was that they actually had um, two identical twins, right? They had twins who were identical. And as we know, in the scientific world, when there's, a, when there's an identical twin, you will have pretty much the exact same genes. Now, what's interesting is that one of the twins um, was obese. And they took uh, mice and they had grown mice and whatnot in a lab. And they had grown them under sterile conditions where they made sure that they did not have any gut microbiome or very minimal at the least. And what they did is that they took some of the uh, feces or the gut microbiome from the obese tin. Uh, obese twin um, individual, which was a human, and they placed it within one of the mice. And what they saw was the, mo the mouse before was at a normal weight, but when they placed the fecal matter or the gut microbiome into the mouse, they found that the mouse later on became obese, which is quite fascinating. So they've, and they've done these studies and they replicate these studies in many different areas, not just for obesity and not just in mice, but they're, they're starting to do more and more studies uh, along these lines. And so what they've come up with, the scientists and the researchers, is that in reality, the gut microbiome has an effect on almost every organ system. And when there is an imbalance, when you have a dysbiosis, when there's an imbalance, you can get disease. So I listed some I listed some organ systems and some diseases that can occur that have been known to occur by imbalance of the gut microbiome. So first and foremost, a gastro gastrointestinal system, the GI system, which is obvious because it's it's happening in the GI tract, and we've seen that when there's an imbalance, celiac disease occurs, inflammatory bowel disease, meaning Crohn's disease, uh, ulcerative colitis can occur. Even cirrhosis also is somehow associated with the gut microbiome imbalance. In the endocrine system, you can get diabetes type 1 and type 2, obesity, as we mentioned with that uh, mouse study, um, immune system problems, you can get autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. In the cardiovascular system, you get cardiovascular disease. You can get metabolic syndrome. You can, you can be at increased risk for heart attacks. Um, as well as the kidney system or the renal system, you can get chronic kidney disease, integumentary system in the skin. Uh, it's been associated with acne and psoriasis, eczema, the musculoskeletal system, uh, your bones and your muscles. It's been associated with osteoporosis and fractures. The respiratory system, it's been associated with asthma, chronic, uh, chronic, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD and cystic fibrosis in children. And the central nervous system, it's been associated with Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, depression, and autism. And uh, what's what's interesting is, you know, this is all, you know, based on these fecal transplant studies. And there's some other gene splicing that were, you know, some other more high tech um, scientific things that that were done. Um, but essentially, uh, one recent study showed that when they um, improve the microbiome of, uh, of um, autistic children, their symptoms actually improved. And when they did a fecal transplantation, they did a fecal transplantation uh, of, uh, so essentially just to kind of uh, back up, what, what do I mean by fecal transplantation? Fecal transplantation means that you take the feces in the large intestine, which is essentially the stool, and you transplant that in a, in, in a certain manner to another to another individual and um, this actually improved autistic features and autism in um, autistic children and adults over it was, I think it was a month long um, uh, study that was uh, that was um, that was undertaken uh, we do know this uh, that 
with people who have a C. diff infection, which is a uh, infection of the um, uh, um, of the colon with a certain quote unquote bad bacteria called C. diff, um, one of the study, uh, one of the treatment modalities now is fecal transplantation. That if you take feces from or stool from a individual who does not have C. diff and you place that in a certain manner in individuals who who have C. diff, which is that bad infection. Um, the person improves. So this is quite fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And what we've actually seen is that um, uh, the researchers went one step further and they've now established, established what we call gut axes. So a gut axis, so to speak. So there's a gut axis, meaning the microbiome and the gut is a direct bi-directional relationship with another organ system. What that means is, in other words, that the gut microbiome communicates, for example, with the central nervous system, and the central nervous system communicates with the gut. And it's bi-directional, means it's both ways. So there's inputs coming in and going out, and vice versa, and they're both interconnected. Previously, we did not know that this level of connection even existed, and specifically within the gut. And uh, just as an example, um, I have this uh, diagram here from one of the journals. It's called the microbiome gut brain axis. So this is just with the gut and the brain. And as you can see, <clears throat> certain input and stimuli that are um, that are absorbed by the body or the gut translates into uh, certain outcomes. So, for example, if you eat a healthy diet, you will have less stress you will have more concentration or the ability to concentrate it will affect your cognitive behavior if you have increase in stress this will affect your gut and this will um, also cause um, issues with digestion now this we actually kind of already know just very um, you know um, uh, kind of uh, parochially uh, as you know, uh, especially in little children, when when they get um, uh, when they get nervous, or even sometimes with us as adults, when we get nervous, our tummy kind of hurts, right? Um, or when there's a big exam, oh my, you know, my stomach is hurting. Sometimes school children will say, or you know, on the first day of school, right, you're getting butterflies in your stomach, right? So this all, I mean. All of this kind of further explains those feelings that we've always had and it's quite fascinating and um, as you can see there's a lot of factors to this and we're going to go through a lot of these in uh, in some of the other slides okay so this is the reference for that uh, diagram it was taken from the uh, um, uh, journal of uh, gut brain microbiota axis okay now having said that so we talked a good amount about okay the gut microbiome is very important, right? And there's this fascinating new whole universe about how the gut microbiome pretty much affects every single part of your body and all the major organ system. So now that's that's all fun and games and whatnot. That's all you know, awesome to know. It's great, but how will this translate to us? Like, how can we take advantage of this new knowledge? So. The number one thing is we have to optimize the gut microbiome. And the way to do that, according to studies, is to eat different whole, natural, unprocessed foods. And food diversity here is the key. You have to have different types of foods. And um, one you know, uh, principle that I tell my patients all the time is that um, you know, if you can find whatever food that you want to eat, if you find it growing in a forest or jungle someplace, then it's probably good for you, right? And I say probably because sometimes, you know, you could find like, you know, mushrooms that may be poisonous and, you know, whatnot. So, you know, assuming that they're not poisonous, assuming that, it, that you know, that it is healthy. So, for example, you won't find a pizza tree, right? Or a, I don't know, like a burger bush or something. But you will find blueberries, you will find apples, you'll find broccoli, you'll find cabbage. You'll find a whole bunch of different foods that are whole, 
meaning they're unprocessed and they're natural. This is actually the key to, to optimizing the gut microbiome. And this is probably the most important out of all the other things that we're going to talk about is to get that diversity. Um, one way that I, uh, you know, kind of think about it is that you should tr try to eat or drink the rainbow. So what I mean by that is um, you should try to have different colors of fruits and vegetables. So let me put this here. Okay, here we go. So as you can see, these are different, you know, fruits and vegetables divided based on their color. And um, you can see that um, within here, uh, within, for example, the reds, there are different fruits and vegetables. Scientific studies show that when you eat different, when you eat a different color of a fruit and a vegetable, you have a different set of vitamins and minerals. In addition to it helping your gut microbiome, there's different vitamins and minerals even within the same color. So for example, if you eat a red fruit and a red vegetable, right, you will get a set of different vitamins and minerals in the red fruit versus the red vegetable. And, and in, uh, specifically with colors, them, uh, between colors themselves. For example, red has, denotes a certain group of vitamins and minerals that yellow does not have and vice versa. So if you can get all the colors of the rainbow, and if you can get that on a daily basis, or at least a weekly basis, let's put it that way, at least on a weekly basis, then you will know, or you should be rest assured that you're getting whatever vitamins and minerals that your body needs. And this is quite important specifically for adults as we age. When we age the, the food, uh, a diversity that we tend to kind of gravitate towards usually is not very diverse. It's only a handful of things, you know, maybe 10, 15 different items. Other than that, it's, it's not very biodiverse, as we say. Now, one way to get around this, uh, you know, a lot of people, as they grow older, they have a very specific palate. They don't really, you know, some people may not enjoy new foods may not want to experiment and uh, or you know even younger people um so one way to get around this depending upon a person's palate is i recommend getting doing a smoothie at the beginning of the day now this is important a smoothie should contain different fruits and vegetables and what i would recommend is you get a base of fruits and vegetables okay so um, you can get um, certain fruits and vegetables that you like. For example, you say, okay, you know what? I like strawberries, blueberries. Um, I like banana. I like uh, avocado and kale spinach. Okay, so these five things, right? So you put this in your blender every morning and the morning is important and I'll, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, you put this in your blender every morning and what you do is you, um, in addition to these uh, fruits and vegetables, you put in the color of the day. So this is your base and you add the color of the day. So you say, okay, for example, today, you can say today is green, right? So say Wednesday is green, all right? Green color day. So put a green fruit, raw, unprocessed, you know, make sure it's clean and whatnot. Put a chunk of it into the blender and a green raw vegetable as well put that into the blender and blend that. And that's your color of the day. And if you do this throughout the week, you'll get seven different colors. That means seven different fruits of that particular color, seven different vegetables. That's 14 different sets of vitamins and minerals, right? In addition to whatever the base uh, that you have, that, you know, uh, the, uh, the fruits and vegetables that you enjoy. And the good thing about this is this will cause you to buy fruits and vegetables that you can't even pronounce the name of. I mean, I go to the supermarket sometimes. I, I didn't know this vegetable existed, right? I can't even pronounce the name of it sometimes. So this will allow us to buy. And, you know, you don't have to buy in bulk, just literally one item, right? Just one, you know, uh, serving of it um, and try to keep it raw. Make sure it's clean, obviously. Try to keep it raw and just put a small chunk of it. You know, for example, if you're going to put a beet or like a radish in your in your smoothie is probably not the most 
tastiest thing. I never really tried it, but you know, like a raw beet might not be the most palatable, especially early in the morning. Just a small chunk of it into the, into the blender. When you have your other fruits and vegetables that you already like, you know, your base, it doesn't really, uh, you, you won't be able to really tell that it's there. And this is important um, because this way you get that biodiversity, you get that diversity of food, you get the different colors, you get the different vitamins and minerals, and you will establish your gut microbiome as healthy as it can get. Okay. And the second thing, as I mentioned, was the timing early in the morning. So early in the morning means whenever your wake up time is normally, okay. Whenever your wake up time is maybe about 90 minutes to two hours after that, you want to take your first meal. Beginning of the day is not the time for coffee and donuts. Um, it's, uh, you know, you have to be careful what you put into your, to your body. Reason being is scientific studies show that what you eat at the beginning of the day, meaning breakfast, essentially, gets absorbed fully by the body. It is, it is optimally absorbed versus lunch versus dinner. <clears throat> dinner and lunch are not as absorbed by your body as breakfast. That's why, I mean, you've, you've, uh, I mean everyone's have, everyone has heard about breakfast being the most important meal of the day, and this is one of the reasons why. So first thing to put into your body would be something nutritious, right? Not coffee, not donuts, something like a vegetable, fruit, fruit vegetable smoothie. In addition to that, with your smoothie, you can add in some raw oats and some yogurt. This will get you some probiotics and prebiotics, which we're going to get to in the, in the upcoming slides. Okay. So <clears throat> in addition to the, um, you know, the eating the rainbow or drinking the rainbow, eat a high fiber plant-based diet, which, you know, essentially if you were to do the, you know, the rainbow fruits and vegetables, you will essentially meet that as well. Now, scientific studies show that a high fiber plant-based diet is known to reduce inflammation, known to reduce cholesterol and balance the gut microbiome. And it's also, as we know, cuts down on heart disease, stroke, cancer, improves a person's quality of life and improves their uh, length of life, right? And this is all, this is not anything new, this is all scientifically validated. Also, high fiber is really important and you can get this through whole grains. Now, whole grains cause a more steady sugar level in your body and they help it actually helps prevent diabetes and mood swings in, in addition to many other benefits. The, um, the issue comes with many patients that I interact with is that they like to eat white bread or white rice or even wheat bread maybe. Wheat bread, white bread isn't the healthiest. Now, wheat bread is, is more healthy than white, okay? but white bread and white rice this is processed this is refined essentially what has happened is all of the nutrients has been uh, you know has been taken out has been refined has been milled out and only the kind of the leftover has been you know has been um, um has been processed into white bread for example the nutritious part of it the husk has been taken out now it tastes it tastes better in terms of you know uh, in terms of you know uh, uh, taste and, and whatnot, but it's not healthy. And actually, if you take a look at it historically, <coughs> excuse me, historically in the entire world, no one used to eat white bread and white rice. This was very uncommon. This is this is a very recent phenomenon. As of like the late 1800s, once the industrial once the industrial revolution occurred, and we started to kind of have these uh, machines that were able to, you know, process uh, flour and, uh, you know, uh, make bread um, via machine instead of through, you know, via hand. What ended up happening was that this became more uh, accessible and the price dropped. Previously, it would, let's just say about three, 400 years ago, white bread was known as cake, right? Just the regular white sliced bread that we eat was known as cake. Um, you know, the famous uh, saying of, I think, Marie, uh, Marie um, Antoinette, uh, you know, let them have their cake. Uh, she was referring not to like, you know, not to like strawberry shortcake or something. She was referring to like white bread, right? So um, 
and, and at that time, that white bread was refined. It was more expensive. It was not very accessible. And, it's, and now we know it's not very healthy. So historically, people didn't really have, you know, as much diabetes, as much cancer, some of the diseases that we see today, especially in Western countries. And part of it is because of eating whole grains and avoiding refined grains, right? So try to avoid croissants, try to avoid white bread, try to avoid pastries, very important. Um, lastly, on this slide, we, tr we should try to aim for, a, as I mentioned, a high fiber diet. Okay, try to go up to the recommended daily fiber intake. But there's this trial, uh, there was a, a scientific study called the SMILES trial, right? In that SMILES trial, they actually um, fed the, the uh, subjects three times the recommended daily fiber intake. Now, the SMILES trial was a trial that was done in, um, uh, for uh, people with moderate to severe depression. OK, and what they looked at was they looked at uh, uh, people suffering from. Moderate to severe depression and they put them in essentially essentially into two groups, one group, they would do counseling with a counselor and another group, they would focus more on their diet. And one of the key features of their diet was a very high fiber diet and some of the other features of the diet will come later on in the slides as well. Um, what they found was only after 12 weeks, only after three months, they found that 32%, about one third of the subjects, they were able to completely get rid of their depression. Okay. They were able to go into remission successfully. Now, if anyone tries to do this by themselves, if anyone is on depression medication or if they're on any type of psychiatric medication or if they see a psychiatrist or even their family doctor for any type of you know depression or anxiety or any type of other mental health uh, conditions, consult with your doctor before you try this. But you can, you can do this without stopping medication, right? So what I don't, what I would not want anyone to do is to stop their medication and say, hey, you know, I heard that, you know, if I do three times a fi uh, you know, daily fiber intake, I should be good. No. Increase your fiber intake while taking your medication and then go back to your doctor, whoever's managing the medication, let them know, hey, this is what I heard, this is what I'm doing, what do you think, this is how I'm feeling, you know, after a few weeks. So once again, very fascinating. All right, besides the whole grains, you want, we should consume fermented foods. Fermented foods are naturally rich in probiotics. Now, probiotics are good bacteria that are in the microbiome, they call the microbiome home. So these foods are actually naturally rich in probiotics and the probiotics are just a fancy name for bacteria good bacteria <clears throat> the bacteria actually themselves cause a fermentation so that's why they're rich in probiotics because the bacteria themselves cause a fermentation and the fermented foods they help balance the gut microbiome some examples are yogurt kimchi sauerkraut kefir um, actually if you look at different cultures almost every single culture around the world has their own um, fermented food. And the reason for that is previously, before the advent of refrigerators or ice boxes even, um, people had to preserve their food. And one of the ways that you can preserve food in a wholesome manner is to ferment it. And fermentation essentially means that you take out the water, which if, you know, if there's water in a certain type of uh, food substance, it can cause uh, rotting, you know, the food can spoil. So the fermentation process takes that out and, and instead fermentation takes place. <laughs> so fermentation, uh, so fermented foods are very, very helpful. And, you know, in that fruit smoothie, fruit vegetable smoothie in the morning, you want to throw in some yogurt in there. Or, you know, if you want keen cheese, sauerkraut, you know, kefir is also another type of yogurt, <clears throat> a yogurt-like substance, excuse me. <clears throat> okay, fermented foods. Okay, the next thing. This is actually very interesting as well. Consume foods rich in polyphenols, right? This stimulates a healthy microbiome. Uh, what is What are polyphenols? Polyphenols are substances such as whole grains, we just talked about, dark chocolate. So this does not mean, does not mean milk chocolate or white chocolate, unfortunately. Dark chocolate, okay, darker the better. Olive oil green tea, blueberries. And, and, you know, if you've been paying attention thus far, you see that many of these ingredients or in many of these substances, substances that I'm talking about 
are actually also present in the Mediterranean diet. They're also present in the vegan diet, which, you know, have, uh, which actually have scientific evidence, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, which have scientific evidence that it prevents certain diseases, it, it promotes a healthy lifestyle. So whole grains, dark chocolate, olive oil, green tea, blueberries, actually berries in general, to be honest, I just put blueberries there, but any type of berry, very high in uh, um, uh, antioxidants and polyphenols. So strawberry, blueberry, cranberry, blackberry, raspberry, any berries, really, really healthy. So you wanna put some berries in your fruit smoothie in the morning. Okay, also try to get some prebiotics in your, uh, um, in your diet or in the fruits, veggie smoothie in the morning. Okay, what are prebiotics? Prebiotics are a type of fiber that help the probiotics, that help the, uh, the good bacteria flourish. Essentially, it's food for probiotics. That's what it is. And some examples are bananas, oats, apples, asparagus, nuts, artichoke. There's a whole bunch of them. So if you can add this to your diet, this will help stimulate growth of the probiotics. Okay. So um, optimizing the gut microbiome here. Okay, here we go. Now, consider taking a probiotic. Let me just see how much uh, time I have. I'm doing well on time. Um, okay. All right, so uh, back to the slide here. Consider taking a probiotic. So probiotic we just talked about that's present in, um, it's present in uh, uh, yogurt. It's present in fermented foods. Um, you can also get probiotics over the counter. Okay, now there's a lot of brands and varieties of probiotics. Um, however, because it is considered a supplement, it's not FDA regulated, right? So that means that there's really no oversight on what is actually placed in a probiotic. So some discretion is needed. Okay, now when would a probiotic be, be um, helpful? Probiotic would be helpful if there's some type of event that causes an imbalance. Say you have an infection and you need an antibiotic. You have either, maybe you have, uh, maybe you got the stomach flu. At that time, a probiotic may be helpful. Um, or you've taken an antibiotic. Antibiotic kills good bacteria as well as bad bacteria. So during those times, a probiotic may be good. But I prefer, due to you know, different various scientific studies, fermented foods because they're more natural form of probiotics. Now, this is not to say that over-the-counter probiotics are not helpful. They are helpful, and there's scientific studies to back those as well. Specifically, there's a strain called Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG that's been shown to be extremely helpful in traveler's diarrhea, in cases of gastroenteritis, which means, you know, when you have the stomach flu or when you eat, or when you get food, uh, when you get food poisoning, this actually does help quite a bit. Um, it goes it goes by many brand names, but uh, one brand name is Cultural. It's 100% uh, Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. Another one is Align. They have different, uh, you know, different brands out there. But essentially, this may be helpful. Now, if you're getting the diversity of foods, as we mentioned in the previous slides about, you know, eating the rainbow, uh, over-the-counter probiotic may not be essentially, may not be that necessary unless, you know, uh, on a as-needed basis, okay? All right. Now we talked about what you should eat. Now we're going to talk about what you should not eat, right? Or what you what you should limit. So limit antibiotic use, and this is really really important. As I just mentioned, just you know, just in the previous slide, antibiotics kill kill both good and bad bacteria, right? And if you use antibiotics or overuse them, you can get antibiotic resistance, which means that the bacteria that you were that were that were initially susceptible to the antibiotics over a period of time will now become resistance will now become resistant and will not that that uh that uh, uh antibiotic pill will not work against the same bacteria so this is a huge problem now in the scientific community and i'm sure many of you know this as well antibiotic resistance is now rampant and so we should limit antibiotic use just for that reason alone but in addition to that it, you know, using antibiotics, uh, uh, antibiotics causes decrease in the good bacteria, which causes diarrhea, bloating, and some studies even cause, uh, some studies even pin that there's some weight gain as well involved. Um, 
Unless it's necessary, do not take antibiotics, especially for common viral infection. Okay, if a person has a cold, if a person has um, some type of um, uh, uh, some type of uh, you know upper respiratory infection, um, the sniffles. This is not the time to pressure the doctor to give antibiotics. Now, in the olden days, previously, like we're talking about 30, 40 years ago, physicians, unfortunately, due to a lack of knowledge, were prescribing antibiotics. And that, in some patients, that has now become the norm or the standard of care in their eyes. So some patients will tell me, Doc, you're not, you're doing me a disservice if you don't give me antibiotics for this cold, because Every year I get this infection and every year the infection gets better with this antibiotic. Scientific studies have proven that is false. That does not necessarily occur. It's not, it, that, that is more of a myth. And not only will that lead to antibiotic resistance, but it will also uh, cause an imbalance of the gut microbiome. Now, one of the other uh, really severe uh, side effects of, uh, of uh, overdoing an antibiotics is getting C. diff infection. C. difficile infection is a uh, is a bacteria that can overgrow. That's present in the in the large intestine naturally, but because the other bacteria are are killed off, this bacteria actually ends up growing and prolifer proliferating to the point that it can cause disease, and it can you can get now what what's called C. diff diarrhea, and what's been associated with advanced age. And antibiotics. So the older a person is, the more likely they are to have a C. diff, especially with antibiotic use. So it's important to limit antibiotic use. Also, limiting intake of processed foods and artificial sweeteners. Okay, this once again promotes an imbalance. Limit alcohol. Stop smoking. Anytime, any time a person takes processed foods or something that's artificial, something that, you know, as I mentioned previously, that is not present within, you know, like a jungle or a forest someplace, they are setting themselves up, they are setting themselves up for some type of imbalance to occur in their gut. Now, the advice that I've given so far is to pretty much eat healthy, right, which is to eat a, you know, whole grains, eat different colors of fruits and vegetables, limit processed foods, limit alcohol, stop smoking, all of these things affect the microbiome. And many of you might be wondering, well, this isn't anything, you know, this is nothing like groundbreaking new advice here. And that's true. This just goes to reaffirm that eating healthy, exercising, what we've been saying all along, actually, there's another reason for it. And there's a very powerful, powerful reason for it, because it will mess up the gut microbiome and will cause disease. What can help the gut microbiome is exercise. Uh, studies show that the gut microbiome uh, will positively change, will actually change and produce positive health effects when a person exercises. Recommended daily exercise for an average adult is about 150 minutes per week. You can split that up you know, over five days, 30 minutes a day for about five days, uh, or in whatever manner is appropriate. Studies have, studies have shown that athletes have higher levels of protective bacteria. And that protective bacteria is protective in the sense that it, it helps prevent obesity. Now, recent studies show that any type of movement is beneficial, any type of movement. You know, even if a person, whatever a person's baseline movement is, whatever it is, if you were to do a little extra than that, for example, like say, you say, okay, doc, I, um, I move around my house, I go up and down the stairs, right? Or I, you know, walk around the block once, if that's your baseline, if you do a little extra, like maybe 10 extra steps, that will actually be enough to provide benefit to your gut microbiome. So any type of movement, and this could be a, uh, for a person who's bedridden. If a person is bedridden, if they're lying flat on their bed, if they're able to sit up, that'll help. Even just that much or that little actually has been shown scientifically to be beneficial. Another uh, aspect is to reduce stress, right? And so if someone is stressed, uh, uh, that will cause a change in their gut microbiome. Uh, you know, when you feel stress, you're, you get you know, butterflies in your stomach, you, your stomach feels queasy. This is, uh, you know, a very common, uh, very common symptom. 
way to reduce stress is to kind of, you know, sometimes you can do things such as art or, um, you know, meditate or prayer or, or exercise, anything that, uh, you know, that you've kind of figured helps reduce your stress, right? Also, sleep is very essential to maintain a, a healthy gut microbiome. And the gut microbiome itself affects sleep quality, and the sleep quality affects the gut microbiome. When a person is sleep deprived, it actually changes the composition of the gut microbiome. And specifically, when a person is traveling, especially between time zones, if you're traveling internationally, it will mess up the sleep cycle. And that'll also mess up a person's gut. And you know, I think we've all experienced that. If you, you know, travel through different time zones, your, you know, your stomach doesn't feel well, and it's because of the, the lack of sleep, in addition to the difference in food and, you know, difference and, and the increased stress level when you're traveling, especially on long flights, all that kind of plays a part. Now, for older adults, uh, it's important to remember that as humans, just to kind of take a step back, as humans, we actually have the gut microbiome in us is starting to develop even in the womb before we're even out into the real world. And the gut microbiome composition changes as we progress through different life stages. So the gut microbiome of an infant versus the fetus or versus a toddler versus a, you know, a school age child, teenager, adult, older adult is different. But as adults age, what happens is there's, there's less acid secretion in the stomach. Okay. And also there's less diversity in the microbiome. And because of this, older adults tend to develop more disease. Now, that's not the only reason. There's obviously other reasons for it, but this is one of the contributing factors. So one action item, one very key action item is to increase the diversity of nutrients. In addition to what we talked about, I think once again, the best way to do that, I believe, is to really um, get your get your nutrients up front at the beginning of the day and it gets absorbed it's you know better for you it's you know you get everything that you need up front and as, as the day progresses you will see yourself with a lot more energy and i've you know i've done this myself i you know when i when i have the fruit veggie smoothie in the morning i don't feel hungry till you know late afternoon and and i'm and i'm still you know running on all cylinders so I would really encourage everyone to give that a try. And I'm gonna go back to that slide. So that's actually my last slide. Let's go back to this slide here. So probably the most important slide is eat the rainbow, drink the rainbow. All right, so um, let's open up for uh, any questions. We do have a few questions here. Um, let's see, first is about fecal transplants. Uh, has there been any evidence to show that a fecal transplant can eliminate disease like celiac in the recipient? So um, this is all very new studies uh, that have been, uh, um, that are still being undertaken. We know for sure for C. diff infection, it does. Now for IBD, for celiac disease, it improves, but the the question now becomes okay how long is that going to stay with that person so um that's still being figured out so sometimes okay now you you do something and um uh, sorry you do the fecal transplant and you have to kind of like um uh you have to uh, kind of give it a booster right uh, every so often for how what when is that booster due Booster meaning you get like another fecal transplant. When does that do? How much do you need? All that is still being figured out. And it's still far from, you know, making it into mainstream medicine just yet. But the roots are there. It's very exciting stuff. It's very, you know, um, it, 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 it gives a lot of promise for the future. Great. Uh, next question is cleanses have become very popular. Um, is this something we should be doing to clean out our gut? And if so, what should that be? So yes, cleanses are popular. Uh, the problem with cleanses is that, that they're, vi they're very unreliable in the sense that certain people will respond to a cleanse uh, uh, in, a, in a certain manner, positive. 
positively or sometimes negatively. Now, I, I'm not, I don't think there's any studies about cleanses that are very definitive, but um, what I can say is that there's more evidence for just eating a varied diet, just a, you know, just eating different types of fruits and vegetables, different colors of fruits and vegetables. That would be the cleanse that I would recommend. That itself is the cleanse according to recent scientific studies. Fantastic. Um, next question. Uh, if you're someone that's used to having caffeine in the morning, is there another time that you recommend consuming it if this is something that your body's already used to? If you need that boost of energy that or focus. So if you're oh. someone that is used to having caffeine in the morning, is there a better time to consume it if you're used to having that for work and focus? Oh, uh, yeah, no, you can. Okay, so uh, you can definitely do that in the morning. Uh, you should do it after you take in your fruit vegetable smoothie and try to do something like green tea, which has, uh, uh, you know, a high level of antioxidants in it, which, um, will promote gut health, but coffee is fine too. Coffee can, you know, depending on different factors in the coffee, like, you know, how much cream sugar are you putting in, um, that, uh, you know, uh, that also plays a part, but you can have coffee uh after you you know have something healthy in the morning okay and what about organic versus non-organic fruits and vegetables is there any indication or difference with, with the chemical and pesticides um on those fruits and vegetables that are going to affect our gut health so for that there's there's a lot of controversy uh regarding that um so um I have to be careful what I say because you know there's certain um, companies and whatnot that that may that may take uh, um, that may take offense. But what I'll say is this: is that um, I think that if the fruit and vegetable, if you're if if you're consuming it and if it's not causing any harm, you should be okay. And you know, obviously, you want to. you want to be free of those pesticides. Um, is there a scientific basis for organic versus non-organic that I will leave unsaid due to political reasons? Can you list some examples of whole grains? Yes, whole grains. For example, um, uh, you can get uh, whole grain bread. So, so bread is a type of a whole grain, barley, wheat, um, oats, like, you know, uh, uh, overnight oats. Um, what else? Um, you know, sometimes in like the supermarkets, you get like multi-grain bread. Those are all whole grains versus, um, versus, uh, you know, uh, some of the more processed. And actually, to be honest with you, wheat bread, you have to be a little careful of certain wheat breads are processed and some, and if you actually look at the ingredients, some of them will have sugar added to them. So you want to avoid the sugar. Um, and um, they'll, they'll have something like raisin juice or something like that, which is essentially a sugar additive. But um, but yeah, any type of whole grain. Um, so for example, barley, wheat. Um, I don't think there's another one. I um, uh, can't think of it at the top of my head. But um, uh, geez, I'm just I, it's at the tip of my tongue. But um, if I remember, quinoa. Quinoa is one. Yeah. There's another one too. Uh, um, uh, this is going to kill me. Uh, anyway, it'll yeah, come back it, to you. <laughs> it'll come back. Hopefully. Uh, what do you think about taking a shot of apple cider vinegar a day in terms of probiotic and gut health? Yeah. So, um, uh, and I, I saw that there's something about kombucha as well. So, yes. um, kombucha is a, is a fermented drink, right? And, um, and, uh, apple cider vinegar. So yeah, both of them are are okay. I'm not. There's the problem with those apple cider vinegar and the kombucha. There's some conflicting evidence, but kombucha is uh, is um, is fermented, so it it will have probiotics in it. The um, the case for apple cider vinegar, I'm not I'm not so sure about that. I, it doesn't mean that it's not valid. I'm I just have not uh, done the research on that. And uh, are dairy alternatives such as almond milk yogurt as effective as regular dairy? 
Um, yeah, so you can get you can get probiotics um, it, through uh, non dairy sources. So now does almond milk have probiotics? I don't know. I don't know that answer uh, to that question. But you if you do not if you want to avoid dairy, which is fine, you can get it through like sauerkraut, kimchi, you know, there's many different ways to get your probiotics. Is there such thing as taking too much probiotics? either in supplement so, okay. form or in food form? So that's a very good question. And um, uh, in food form, no. Okay, food form, because you're, it's, it's in a natural form. So you know, the only way that it would be harmful in a food form is if that's only what you're consuming. For example, if you only consume yogurt and nothing else the entire day, then you would not be getting proper nutrients. It's not necessarily because you're getting too much yogurt. It's because you're getting an absence of the other nutrients that your body needs. However, with the supplements, though, if you overdo it on the supplements, for example, there's there's something called CFUs, colony forming units. OK, the standard is about 10 billion colon, uh, CFUs, colony forming units for an adult, 5 billion for children. If you do more than 10 billion, some people, depending on their current state of health may get diarrhea with that. And, and sorry, I shouldn't say diarrhea. They get looser stools. So they, it mimics diarrhea, but it's not diarrhea. And um, that's because there's an increase in the probiotic in, in, in certain bacteria, uh, bacterial colonies. So I would, I would caution to use more than what's recommended than the 10 billion. But in certain situations, depending on certain disease states, you may actually need 30 billion. So it kind of depends on the situation, but for a general healthy person, I would not do more than 10 billion. Can you discuss some signs and symptoms um, that would indicate poor gut health? Poor gut health, yes. So for example, bloating, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, diarrhea, okay, constipation. Um, uh, uh, um, issues with um, heartburn, indigestion, all of these uh, are very obvious um, symptoms of poor gut health. Less obvious symptoms are things like irritability, decrease in concentration. So all the different organ systems that we talked about, some of those symptoms from those organ, sy uh, from those organ systems can actually be uh, uh, be um, uh, uh, can be originating from the gut. And the way that you can figure that out is if you eat healthy and if you do a little bit of exercise, does that solve the problem or not? And most of the time, if a person eats healthy, many of this irritability issues, being moody, depressed, they actually will improve. Okay. I think that's all that we have for today. Um, thank you everyone for attending. I hope you found the presentation informative and helpful. Please be on the lookout for a follow-up email that will include a recap and information on additional resources, as well as a feedback survey. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Levy Longevity Series presented by Ascension Illinois. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.